Hello, my name is Elsa Olivetti, and I'm at the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And I'm going to talk to you about some of our work focusing on thinking about the greenhouse gas emissions of materials. Uh, and while there are many metrics of sustainability when we think about materials impact, here we're going to focus on strategies to mitigate uh, GHG emissions and also think about resource use. In particular, think about the context of how complex uh, that process is. So when we look at environmental implications of materials from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, we have a typical pie chart on the left over here for energy related emissions, not including agricultural emissions, that's dominated by the use of buildings, vehicles, and then this whole segment here that amounts to about a third of this pie based on materials. So materials impact is dominated by metals such as aluminum and steel, cement, chemicals, which includes precursors to polymers, and as well as paper. So reducing the global footprint of materials requires addressing those emissions. So how can we lower the detrimental impact of materials on the environment and how should we invest our efforts? So to answer these questions in detail, we need to look at the uh, different opportunities for reducing CO2, which we've done here on the right. We've prioritized strategies for achieving targeted reductions in metals, cement, and ceramics as shown here on the right. I'm plotting potential CO2 mitigation by 2050 on the y-axis and various ways to get to this reduction broken down into inputs, transformations, and outputs outputs along the life cycle state. And color corresponds to technology readiness. And so the dashed blue line there at the top is the um, IPCC two degrees C target for each of these materials. And the information that we need to add to get to these stacked bars is technical constraints about what percentage of each materials market is relevant based on product performance, and then an assessment about the technical state of these materials, including the degree of change required throughout the supply chain, manufacturing barriers to scaling, and all sorts of technical limits that need to be addressed. And so addressing these barriers can come in a few forms. We can accelerate implementation of each of these strategies. We can help each strategy reach its full potential, therefore model expected impact related to this context, but then also extend each strategy to fill that gap that's shown in the black bracket. But we need to do so without shifting burdens. Um, as unintended consequences could happen that could increase the burden elsewhere. And so I feel that we can't really make actionable impact at a systems level unless we understand the fundamentals at each length scale from atoms all the way to industrial infrastructure. And for me, that's a really critical role for material scientists is bridging this gap from the fundamental up to the system's impact. And this is something that we've covered in a review we have coming out soon that I encourage you all to look at. What I'm going to do today is just highlight two little threads related to research in my group, and in particular, try to highlight some of that complexity that I talked about in the beginning. So the first thing that I want to make a brief mention of is scalability in research, in particular, and how that um, helps us support electrification. We think about scalability along these four axes shown here. And the example I'm going to show is related to materials supply chains, but also linking materials properties to process cost. At a high level, as researchers were trained and we train our students to develop new technologies with really the aim of optimizing a fairly narrow set of performance metrics, uh, such as some particular technical performance without regard to the manufacturing uh, scalability of these inventions. And I think this is particularly acute in material science. Chemical engineers tend to think about scaling and process and mechanical engineers tend to think about uh, um, from a device and um, a product perspective. But really as material scientists, we need to start to think about the kinds of metrics we've got over here on the right. Uh, mass and energy transfer throughout environment, what sorts of process yields we might have at scale, and then really optimize around several key outcomes. And in particular, think about the sustainability in terms of resource use or greenhouse gas emissions. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is materials availability. And so why do we care about materials availability and its potential uh, for supply constraints? It's their impact on price. And so on the left, you'll, you see a figure by Professor Chang and uh, Professor Green in chemical engineering and material science at MIT, where they're putting price uh, per lithium ion battery packs in dollars per kilowatt hour on the y-axis as a function of time. And they found that materials costs might set a practical lower bound on battery price. And so they've constructed a two-stage learning curve that we see here. I don't have time to go in the, into detail here, but we project active material costs and battery pack price. And the figure shows past and projected price trajectories 
of the battery pack using this two-stage learning model. And it, you can see that the learning curve uh, in blue starts to approach the materials costs and the green line is supported by that gray period below. So it isn't that we're worried about materials availability in terms of material running out. It's about risk and it's about this risk's influence on price. So there are several key um, complexities that we want to take into account, particular market imperfections that might be inherent to a specific material, whether or not that's substitutable, what the feasibility of those alternatives are, and then what sorts of economic constraints might be present in the market in which these operate. So just understanding that by materials availability, I'm, I'm not meaning that it's scarce necessarily, but that the risk will be too high to, um, deemed too high by a particular decision maker, which might limit its implementation. And so I'll just show one example from our work in particularly uh, where we've tried to integrate it at approaches where we think about things at a mine level or plant level all the way up to the systems level. And here's an application of what we've done that's related to scaling electrification and namely around materials availability associated with cobalt, which is often used as a potential limitation in battery scaling because of social issues around the Democratic Republic of Congo, but also these availability concerns. So the graph on the left shows cobalt supply by principal metal from which it's obtained. This is from 2015 to 2030 based on individual mine assessments. The solid regions are scheduled mine production and the hash lines are from simulated results. And here we get an insight into how cobalt will be extracted in the next 10 years and where investments might need to be given in order to increase demand. And on the right hand side there, you see that one of the issues with cobalt is that it's mined as a byproduct of nickel and copper. And so we see going forward that the supply of nickel we've estimated to become from an increasingly um, amount from nickel than has recently been the case. And this is significant because there haven't been as much new nickel projects lately and cobalt extraction from nickel is much less price driven. We see as the availability of cobalt may be governed a bit more by nickel, we might need to think in more detail about this availability relative to scaling questions. And here we're gonna talk again about batteries, but now as we start to think about more forward-facing technology, if we, if we thought about processing trade-offs in conjunction with materials development in particular for solid state electrolytes. So on the left here, I'm showing a figure that illustrates by enabling use of, of thin high capacity metal anodes and electrolyte separators, we could potentially have solid state batteries for higher uh, energy density performance as shown in the numbers there on the bottom. But successful integration of solid state electrolytes into, into fully all solid state batteries remains a largely unsolved problem. Particularly this is due to interface challenges, um, both on the anode and the cathode side, as I'm showing with this particular schematic, where we see key problems at the interface um, on both sides, where we would have processing costs that would, would introduce chemical interdif interdiffusion or development of solid electrolyte um, interface layer that would lead to higher resistance issues. And so in this case, uh, researchers have proposed many strategies for trying to address um, this impact. And I'm showing one example here. A diversity of chemistries has been pursued in the literature that we see on the left-hand side. And this, we used a text and data mining pipeline that I'll make mention of in my final example to extract processing information on how electrolytes are synthesized. The example I'm showing here is a frequency of heating temperature by chemistry. We've got about a thousand papers that we've extracted materials from for ab about five materials. And these are identified by a number of important metrics that are fed into a cost model. So we see here temperature um, variation for LLZO on the top, uh, an oxide-based uh, solid electrolyte versus several sulfide families. And we see the higher temperature that we would expect in the oxide chemistries, but here is where we might have to introduce other interfacial layers in order to deal with the potential interdiffusion of species. So we extract information about which strategies have been pursued to try and address these interfacial issues, and particularly the recipes associated with these strategies. And we link those to techno-economic models to try to get a sense of what those costs might be. And so that's what I'm showing on the right-hand side, just two examples illustrating critical trade-offs in cell design that we're gonna map to cost. The two bar charts represent two of these example strategies that we extracted from the literature. In the first, there's a sputtered tin layer that helps with interfacial resistance performance. And we see a performance increase um, of about 60 million hours per gram. And what that means is that our unit cost in dollars per kilowatt hour goes down. 
but it costs money to deposit these layers. And this is more expensive than the performance gains. And so we see with this particular interfacial strategy, we're basically out of wash. Whereas on the right-hand side, if we think about addition of 1% of binder to a sulfide-based chemistry, we see a much higher improvement in performance and not very much cost associated with the binder. This example shows that the earlier we can think about manufacturing scalability in the context of materials development, we can get a sense of how it is possible to employ materials and process solutions that increase cell capacity, but also that the additional materials and performance costs to incorporate those solutions could offset gains in cell performance. And so both of these examples around materials availability and manufacturing scalability show us the ways in which we need to try to link systems impact to materials fundamentals in order to realize strategies towards sustainable materials development. In my final example, I wanted to look at one of the other materials um, that I mentioned at the beginning. So in terms of cement uh, production, what we've done is tried to use uh, modeling tools to try to improve our predictive capability. And in particular, I'm going to uh, discuss how this might enable local context for alternative cementitious materials. So here, if I'm just reminding us of our donut plot and the cement as one of the next highest um, sources of CO2 emissions. And as we know, the calcination of limestone um, in the processing of cement le leads directly to CO2. So any cement uh, or concrete mitigation strategies that I've shown as a list of there on the right, we'd like to pursue what's called clinker, that's the precursor to cement replacement, or reductions in uh, clinker use in cement formulation and cement replacement overall. So there are many constituents that can be used as alternatives uh, to Portland cement, the typical material. We can use natural pozzolans or calcined clay, so those are naturally occurring materials versus a series of waste materials. Fly ash, granulated slag are very commonly used, um, but there are other waste sources such as host consumer glass. The challenge with this is that these materials are not inherently sustainable. Um, their quality and supply may be variable, and most are insufficient to meet the demand at the scale that's needed. So we need to think about these things in terms of the environmental impact in context. There's upstream burdens associated with transporting them and treat pretreatment of these materials, as well as their use and how they might be managed at end of life. So throughout literature, there has been lots of use of alternative feedstocks, and a lot of that is commercially used in terms of coal fly ash and granulated blast slag is that, and granulated blast furnace slag, as I just said. In my group, we've experimentally looked at, at agricultural residues in alkali activated materials as cement alternative products, and you can see some examples um, of the ash on the left there in the micrograph, uh, and then we have constituted that into a cement alternative through alkali activation, and then used it as in a prototype in India, the region that we're working. And so there are a series of wastes that are potential cement replacements that are not well used. Um, so what I'm showing in the plot here in this table, um, it, it, within this red rectangle, you can see that even though these materials are generated as waste in, in, in reasonable quantities, they're not used as supplemental cementitious materials. Part of that has to do with their lack of reactivity, but also part of it has to do with our inability to take into account um, the, the reactivity of these potential materials um, as a function of things like their chemical properties, right? Their particle size or chemical composition, uh, degree of crystallinity, et cetera. And so what we've tried to do to improve our predictive capability is leverage a pipeline that we've developed to automatically extract information from the literature. And this is particularly that we've applied tools from natural language processing uh, to the material science literature. As we know, text is unstructured and described by free-flowing natural language that's not readily interpretable by machine. And so what I've been doing in the group over the past several years is starting from natural language text, we apply cutting edge, the latest in the computer science community, word embeddings from language models, um, which are then fed into models that classify the types of parts of speech of particular words, whether or not it's a composition, a particle size, et cetera, et cetera. The pipeline that I'm going to show results from in a minute here, we've applied to several cases, including the cement case. And what we've tried to do is cull across all the many one-offs use of waste and natural materials throughout a broad range of literature in, in the cement space, but also nuclear engineering, et cetera, to try to increase our predictive capability in this regard. 
And the basic premise here is that the challenge with scaling up waste materials is that nobody's particularly trying to make the waste. So we can't rely on a single stream as feedstock. If, if we're going to have a truly massively scalable approach, we need to use a combination of flexibility and fleet stock and robustness to it changing. And for that, we need an improved understanding. So on the left hand side, you can see a ternary phase diagram for silica, calcium, and alumina, where we've extracted information from the literature at scale across the various wastes that might and natural materials that might be used uh, as alternative cement materials. And so you see that we could start to think about um, how blends of these materials could be used as replacements to the cement that's shown down here. And we've used this approach in the lab to try to make use of metallurgical wastes, um, which I'm showing just in, in a small experimental form here. Um, and one just sort of point of interest of this data is shown on the right, where we're plotting uh, the chemical composition in terms of those the, uh, the vertices of the ternary phase diagram in terms of frequency for cement, slag, and fly ash. And we see cement, the synthesized material with a much narrower distribution as extracted from the literature um, than for slag and fly ash. And that's more just a point of interest. But what we've done to try to make use of this information is extend this data to extracting not just the physical chemical properties of the material, but also something about reactivity. So we've pulled out oxide composition, compositional ratios, uh, the degree of connectivity of, of the um, materials when they are more amorphous and, and lack long range order, and a series of, of experimental parameters as well. So we've taken the chemical composition on one end of this and linked it to reactivity in the middle here to try to get a sense of which could be used as alternative binders. And I'm just going to show briefly some of the results from that. Here we're showing log dissolution rate on the y-axis as a function of pH. And so the pH might be an indicator of how these materials would be pre-processed in their use of, of supplemental cementitious materials. And so we see the trends in the data as they, from the full range of, of pH. But the more interesting result for us was from that large set of input characteristics of material performance that I showed on the previous slide, we could determine that their dissolution behavior was given by, by the temperature and the pH, so experimental parameters that we control, as well as the non-bridging oxygen per tetrahedron. And this is a structural descriptor that's been proposed in the literature. And we were able to demonstrate that these metrics were interesting across not just the cement space, but through the other disciplines that we accessed as well in terms of glass science, in terms of biogeochemistry. And so this is really a way to try to obtain a very broad um, insight into how reactive these wastes might be, and therefore try to scale their ability to be used as supplemental cementitious materials. And as I said, we've used this to try to increase use of metallurgical wastes within the group. So those are just a couple of examples that I've shown where we really need to try to link materials behavior in a fundamental scale into their systems impact. In the first example around electrification, we need to think about um, materials availability and supply chains and how they might in influence our ability to scale, as well as how technologies we're developing in the lab will scale in terms of their cost implications on manufacturing. And then this final example, because we're trying to make use of secondary waste materials, or this could also be useful in a recycling context, we need to try to develop or locally implementable solutions to these global challenges at scale and leveraging our predictive tools in order to do that might show promise in increasing their scaling. So to conclude, because materials don't exist in isolation, they're part of complex next networks, we need to think about the various scales at which we develop these materials in order to really understand their environmental impact and how to mitigate that impact. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to any dialogue that we're able to have electronically.